can we have joy yet? I mean, I ask this from like our calendar location. We are just a few weeks before Advent begins, a few weeks before the holiday season is kicked off, a time when text messages and calls between my family would normally be flying back and forth as we negotiate meal times and side dishes for Thanksgiving. But none of that is happening this year. It, I'm not sure how it's looked for you, but for us, it's a lot of, you think it's safe yet? No, me neither. And all these like lackluster suggestions of, well, we could Zoom from each of our own Thanksgiving tables and maybe it would feel the same. But we all realize that the more that we try to replicate the usual normal patterns using online video conferencing, the harder it can be to accept this bizarre and heartbreaking situation that we are still in. So can we have joy yet? I ask this from our physical locations, from the landscapes that are scarred from these recent memories of a scorching fire season from trees with leaves and like these bright yellows and oranges from these piles of work to be done before the winter storms move in over us and from the covid cases that just seem to keep rising and rising and rising around us and i ask this also from our emotional locations from the ways that we are having these places inside ourselves that are deep with grief and uncertainty and fear and longing. The ways that COVID has personally affected each of us. The loved ones we've lost, the job insecurity, the ways that we have all of these impossible choices to make regarding when to send children back to school, how and when to visit grandma, whether we should meet in person for worship sooner or later. I mean, in 2020, joy is like this seasonal item that's on the menu all the time, but it never seems to go in season. So I guess it's kind of like, oh, well, I guess I'll just order the gnashing of the teeth and weeping now, I guess. Jalapenos on the side. Thanks. Because, you know, we, it's hard to access joy at this time. It's off the menu. And yet, the word joy shows up ever so briefly in the text for this morning. You know, before the gnashing of the teeth. And even though our Matthew reading ends in teeth gnashing, which, side note, I keep meaning to ask my dentist if he's noticed an uptick in the, like, gnashing-related maladies this year, because it seems like it would be a really common 2020 issue for dentists to be dealing with. But as I was saying, even though the parable this morning ends in teeth gnashing and weeping, in there earlier, we have the word joy just kind of like peeking out at us, right? So the Revised Common Lectionary has offered two tracks for this season after Pentecost that the preacher can choose from. And there, there was another way we could have gone, and it would have moved us in order starting from, genu gen from, <clears throat> from Genesis on a semi-continuous, Genesis semi-continuous, it's hard to say, from Genesis on a semi-continuous journey toward the season of Advent. Or there was the version that I chose to go with, which offers texts that were complementary to one another. Oh, nice hat, Matthew. Ah, oh, thanks, Zephaniah. I sure love the shoes you're wearing. Get it? Because it's complimentary. Anyway, so I give this little detail because I want to call in all three of these readings that we had today um, as I ask whether we can have joy yet, because there's some serious woe and destruction. I mean, there's even a line in our Zephaniah reading today that says, because they have sinned against the Lord, their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. I mean, there's some serious wrath happening here, and it seems like this hard place to find a word like joy. And yet, it is the text that complements our epistle reading and our gospel reading, right? So there's, it's going to be in there somewhere, right? I don't know, somewhere in between the dust and dung. 
in our epistle reading from First Thessalonians, it opens up with this jarring reminder that we just can't schedule the day of the Lord. I mean, it's not something I can look at my date book and be like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so yes, next Thursday, God's coming. So I should move that dental appointment to Tuesday to have my gnashing checked out. The words thief in the night and labor pains are also used to describe how sudden and unexpected the coming of the Lord will be. We get that sense from the imagery in Zephaniah as well. And, and then, you know, and then some, there's a lot of imagery going on in there. But our epistle continues on, however, with a reminder to stay vigilant and to stay awake, to build one another up and offer support because, I mean, that kind of being ready all the time is hard. It's really hard. It also offers a promise that, and it's one that we're, most of us are familiar with. And it sets this vision of the day of the Lord apart from the one that we read in Zephaniah. We are not destined for wrath because of the way that Jesus Christ has saved us. Even those who are sleepy and not vigilant on the day when the Lord comes. Okay, so, I mean, that's a spot, a spot where we can pinpoint a little joy maybe, right? But are we ready for it? Like, can we have it yet? I feel like we're on this long 2020 road trip and the kids are in the back seat singing, Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And even though the scenery offers some like nice views, my headache is pounding and I can't get past the rolling of my motion sickness to enjoy the rolling hills. And also like, does this like little chunk from our epistle reading, does this nullify that warning that's laid out in Zephaniah about the day of the Lord? And what about the third servant who buried the talent in Matthew? You know, the teeth gnashy one. What does that mean in this context with all of these together? In Zephaniah, it specifically said that folks will be punished for resting in their complacency. complacency. Like, well, God's not actually going to do anything anyway. So I'm just going to just going to sit here and do whatever. And there's like this fake security that they've built up around them in their gold and their fortresses and the walls they've built around their cities and their nations and probably around themselves. And none of that is going to stop God from like capital W wrath, right? That's what Zephaniah is saying because they didn't practice what they preached. They would do one thing in their rituals and another in the wider community. And it sounds an awful lot like sleeping instead of remaining vigilant. And yet we know God sent Jesus and even the sleepers are saved by this like uncontainable, boundless love and outpouring of grace on humanity. So it gets a little like confusing and murky and like, what is, what do we do with all this? So like, why not sleep through everything? And in a, an age where Zoom meetings mean we can stay in like pajama pants all day and still appear professional, that seems like a tempting option. We turn to the gospel for some answers and to uncover how this act of like staying awake is one that invites us into joy, even in times like this where our teeth feel real gnashy. The parable of the talents gets used in a lot of stewardship campaigns sometimes, but it has a lot more to offer than just financial advice. And ew, that's kind of part of like a grossly inflated like capitalistic cultural interpretation anyway, which takes us even farther away from where that deep joy can be found. This the one that we're hoping to grab onto, even if it feels a little premature, is, you know, what we can find in here, as long as we're not, like, just looking at it like money stuff. So, you know. Often, also, when we read, we, when we read these parables, we read God into the protagonist in them. And if we do this across the board, we're in danger of not allowing the full range of grace-filled possibilities. Or worse, we're in danger of assigning our own meaning and condemnation of some folks. I mean, in this parable, if we read the man, um, like the, the master, as God, then we can come to the conclusion that poor people are basically outside of the circle of those whom God blesses. Like, if you read it, you could come to that conclusion. It's It's just part of that. Like... 
However, if we loosen our grip on that literal sense of money and look at the man as, you know, Jesus himself and the talents as faith, then we can expand the way that we understand this parable. A talent is a lot of money. And the man gives these talents to his servants while he is gone. Each one's given a different amount, depending on what the man sees each one is able to handle. And then after a long, 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 long time, the man checks in with the servants again and finds out what they did with this money, which would have enhanced the quality of the servants while they were keeping it for him because they were, as we read in that, they were slaves and they've been given a ton of money to just kind of take care of. So as they're doing this, they are living a better life. And he finds out what they did during that time to either grow the wealth of these talents or in the case of the last one, just to like maintain it as it was. Okay, so let's step away from the money piece of it. If we read this as Jesus has given each of these folks this good news, and that they are under this wide umbrella of grace from God. And then Jesus goes away for a long while. And, you know, hint, hint, he's still gone. You'll expect each of us that has been entrusted this grace, this love, this faith to have done, like, something with it. Something! To have cared for humanity, to have shown God's love in some way, to multiply the blessings we have received from Jesus Christ by extending an extravagant welcome. I mean, something, right? Just something. And so the two servants, hint, hint, that's like all of us who did this, they entered into the joy, ah, joy of their master. The one who dug a hole and buried the blessings and didn't do a darn thing with them and didn't extend the grace past what was already like doled out. Well, they didn't do with this good news what should have been done with it. This servant gets thrown into the outer darkness, teeth gnashing. So like, what about that outer darkness though? Like, can one manage to revel in the joy of their master once they're thrown out there? I mean, good questions, right? And when things are rough, like COVID-19 rough, 2020 rough, it feels like the outer darkness. And our teeth have gnashed. Okay, they've gnashed so much that they, they, we've worn down our enamel and we're getting headaches from like jaw tension. And even in these times where we're grasping for some light, we can still kind of find those single talents that we've buried. Those hidden pockets of faith that we haven't fully brought to their complete purpose. We can dig them up and begin to faithfully spread the good news through our actions and words during times like this. We don't have to just sleep through it just because, you know, we've been assured that even those who are drowsy don't escape God's love. Where can we even begin to get a glimpse of joy if our eyes are closed and we're not awake? So can we have joy yet? Are we there yet? It feels like outer darkness. And we have a long, weird, potentially devastating season ahead of us. And yet, if we continue to show God's love, shine this light that is in us because of Jesus Christ, then yes, we will find that even in these confusing times, joy will be abundant. And may the joy of the divine fill you and may God continue to entrust you with the care and stewardship of this wonderful grace. Amen.